Welcome to Brain and Avat. We are absolutely delighted to be joined by Natasha Haustorf, who is an expert in international law and a UK barrister. And we're going to be talking about the current conflict between uh, Israel and Hamas. Um, Natasha, would you like to start with the events of October 7th? The circumstances that, that cause us to uh, come together uh, now three months after the 7th of October uh, are unfortunate to say the least. Uh, it was in the early hours of the 7th of October that Israel experienced an attack uh, planned, as we now know, for at least two years by the internationally prescribed terror organization Hamas. Uh, an attack that began, of course, with uh, the firing of rockets and air raid sirens. Uh, and that now appears to have been a cover for mass infiltrations through the border on a scale uh, which overwhelmed uh, the limited security forces, which were at that time uh, on a religious holiday um, stationed around the border area. And we all know now of the atrocities that were committed uh, by Hamas and other Palestinian terrorist organizations, and by all accounts also by ordinary civilians who followed through those border breaches. When I say this had been planned for a number of years, it's important to understand that many people in Israel, uh, while they would have been shocked uh, that such truly horrific events uh, could have happened, the nature of what happened uh, may not have come as a surprise to many. And that is because if you have followed uh, the media uh, and literature and educational resources, uh, specifically of, of the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip, but also across the Palestinian Authority and, and the West Bank, um, the nature of what was perpetrated was not surprising. In fact, uh, it has been a part of the um, stated agenda, certainly of Hamas, but also of other Palestinian terrorist organizations. Uh, and it is part and parcel, unfortunately, of an education system instituted 30 years ago through the Oslo Accords uh, under the control of the Palestinian Authority, in which uh, suddenly the terrorists that crossed the border on the 7th of October had been educated uh, from a very young age that the highest calling in life was martyrdom and uh, that their, their highest uh, aim ought to be to slaughter as many Jews as possible. 3,000 terrorists don't wake up one morning and decide that it's a good day to slaughter Jews. And you do not create thousands of people who can perpetrate the kind of atrocities that we saw on the 7th of October, cutting the uh, belly open of a pregnant woman, burning and, and beheading children, maiming them in front of their families, mass rape and slaughter, um, and uh, the mutilation of people, uh, both dead and alive. That is not um, conduct that I believe is natural in human beings, and it has to be taught and instilled in a very uh, concentrated uh, manner and, and with a concerted effort. And according to UN statistics, if we look at the number of children who are educated, who've grown up in the UNRWA school system, UN-run schools, three out of four of the terrorists who crossed the border on the 7th of October were educated in that school system, were educated to commit those sorts of terror atrocities. There are also other factors uh, that led to the ability of uh, Hamas and other terrorist organizations to infiltrate into Israel to commit the atrocities of the 7th of October. And when I say other Palestinian terror organizations, uh, amongst the terrorists that committed those atrocities were PFLP members. Uh, the affiliates of Fatah, the so-called moderates in the West Bank uh, that run the Palestinian Authority, uh, and there were Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And it's important to remember that all of those terrorists who had previously been convicted and, and some of those that planned the attacks of the 7th of October uh, were released in the Gilad Shalit deal, members of, of Hamas and the Nuhba force, um, they had been paid salaries continuously by the Palestinian Authority, the so-called moderates in this equation. These terror salaries under the pay for slay program, which is enshrined in Palestinian law, uh, are paid to terrorists irrespective of what banner they coalesce under. And they are paid on the basis of the severity of their crimes. 
how many Jews they have managed to slaughter uh, and the length of their sentences. And so the incentivization of terror and the education and indoctrination towards terror that we have seen uh, for a number of decades both contributed significantly to the 7th of October atrocities. But there is another factor that needs to be taken into account to understand the context uh, of those events. And that is international pressure for security concessions. Because between uh, January and August 2023, there were over 400,000 entrances from Gaza into southern Israel, mostly work permits, uh, permitting people from Gaza to come and work in the communities that lived in the south uh, along the border with Gaza. And we now know that these um, entrances, uh, the workers that came over on these permits, were central to the planning of this attack, an attack that involved uh, units of terrorists spreading out across the southern communities uh, with clear instructions, uh, paperwork that was found on them, with maps, detailed information, house by house, uh, on a on a household by household basis, how many people, how many children, whether there was a dog, whether there was a gun, and what they were instructed to do to each family. And when one takes into consideration that the people that lived in these southern communities were amongst uh, the most vocal proponents for coexistence, for cooperation, for initiatives, uh, for water supply uh, in Gaza uh, and uh, economic initiatives, uh, driving Palestinian civilians of the Gaza Strip uh, to hospital uh, in Israel across the border when they were coming for treatment. These are the people that were attacked. Uh, these are the people that had done more than anyone else in Israel to seek to foster positive relations with their neighbors. Uh, and they paid for uh, that with their blood. Uh, and the security concessions, uh, one of which I've highlighted in the context of uh, the permits that permitted uh, people from the Gaza Strip to come into Israel on a regular basis, were also unfortunately a, a very significant factor in the planning and the ability of Hamas to execute uh, what was the bloodiest day uh, in Jewish history since the Holocaust. Thank you, Natasha. This, it's a, a difficult topic, especially on a philosophy show, because something that we do with all of our guests, uh, even if we agree with our guests, which in this case I do, is to present objections um, that would cool. be offered from the other side. Um, so I'm going to try and do that, even though I don't hold these objections. Uh, I don't normally have to give a caveat like that. Normally in philosophy, we can play with positions, but here this is a really serious topic. Um, so one of the objections given, and there's many, but one of the objections given um, is that the empirical data is wrong. So yeah. these terrible things didn't happen, or there's a minimizing. So they'll, so, so objectors will say, well, th there weren't any rapes. There weren't. Um, and then it's difficult to, it's difficult to, to argue against false accusations or false, false news being propagated. How or do false you, denials, as the case may be. False denials. Yeah. So, so, so how do you go about trying to defend empirical claims, um, against people who try to minimize the horrors of, of what happened? Very early in this process, uh, I was invited to uh, a debate at University College Dublin in Ireland. And the very first uh, contribution from the floor in terms of questions uh, was, where is your evidence for the 7th of October? Um, and while it may have been surprising at the start of uh, this process, that immediately after those atrocities were committed, um, in a way, we've got used to these false denials. And of course, the, the straightforward answer to that is look at the material that Hamas themselves put out. If you don't want to take the word of Israeli survivors, witnesses of the Zaka team that collected these bodies and documented and gave interviews explaining uh, the aftermath of these victims of grotesque sexual assaults of gang rapes of broken pelvises of teenage girls uh, that were simply left uh, shot in the head after these violent sexual assaults had taken place. If you're not prepared to take into account uh, all of that overwhelming evidence and in the context of you know, believing victims and uh, the, the modern movement, especially in relation to violence against women, uh, that is extraordinary in and of itself. But put all of that aside and look at what Hamas have put out themselves. 
because they haven't hidden their crimes and their atrocities. On the contrary, they have celebrated them. They have circulated footage of their atrocities with glee, and they have promised to do the 7th of October over and over again. The fact that we also see schizophrenic uh, uh, changes to this, and, you know, on the one hand, they say the 7th of October didn't happen, and these are all Israeli lies, all the atrocities were not committed, or they only targeted combatants and not civilians. I mean, we know that's not the case because by the same token, they also celebrate their crimes. So um, I, I find that uh, in, when dealing with false denials, uh, one really has to pick one's battles. If people are not willing to engage uh, with the obvious and the evidence uh, that has been uh, transmitted around the world uh, and also compiled uh, by the Israeli authorities uh, in the sort of 42 minute long uh, video of, of some of the atrocities captured on Hamas GoPros uh, and the like, um, then, uh, then I think these are conversations that are probably not going to be productive. So the Israeli response has been that in order to secure the safety of its citizens, um, to secure Jewish life, not just in Israel, but really around the world, because Israel is a safe haven for all Jews, that it is now imperative to eradicate Hamas. Now, engaging in its war, um, there have been some horrible civilian casualties, as I think you would find in any war. Can you tell us a bit about what are the requirements to fight a war that meets the international law standards of a just war? Uh, so just war theory, uh, and, and I appreciate it on a philosophy show, this is something uh, that, that people will wish to engage in, at, at perhaps more so than any practicalities of it, um, is, is uh, very interesting from an academic standpoint. Um, so far as Israel's response is concerned, one doesn't need to go uh, any further than a very basic and fundamental uh, aspect of customary international law, if you will, which is self-defense. Um, it is not bestowed on any state, this right of self-defense. It is an inherent right of self-defense. It is considered so fundamental. It is recognized in Article 51 of the UN Charter as being inherent, uh, and no one can take that away. Uh, no circumstances can stop a state defending itself and critically defending its citizens. That is, of course, any uh, democratic uh, government's primary responsibility. And in the context of exercising one's self-defense, the rules of armed conflict govern what is lawful and what is not lawful in uh, international humanitarian law, or, uh, the laws of war. There are three key principles that govern uh, a state's behavior in armed uh, conflict. The rule of military necessity means that a state can only undertake action which is militarily necessary to advance its military aims. Uh, a second rule of international uh, humanitarian law is the rule of distinction, which means that law-abiding states are required to distinguish between combatants and civilians and only combatants and military objects may be targeted uh, by strikes, um, and civilians and civilian objects are not permitted to be targeted, uh, but they may unfortunately come into a calculation of uh, proportionality. And the proportionality rule is the third key rule in the law of armed conflict. And that requires that a, a strike that is militarily necessary and that targets military infrastructure, military targets, must nonetheless also be proportionate, which means that the anticipated military advantage of a strike uh, must be balanced against the anticipated likely civilian collateral damage. Though international law uh, as a framework in armed conflict works on the assumption, the basis that civilians uh, will unfortunately be killed uh, in the that is a, a gruesome, uh, deadly uh, context that war is, and that is perhaps the most misrepresented uh, rule of customary international law and the law of armed conflict. Uh, it's frequently suggested that proportionality is about balancing casualty figures on both sides. I mean that is um, grotesque. It is plainly incorrect as a matter of law, but also as a matter of of common sense. Uh, I'd say it's objectionable uh, that there needs to be a uh, comparison of casualty figures. It leads to the um, uh, ultimate conclusion that you know, not enough Jews have 
died to uh, justify Israel's response and taking out uh, Hamas. That that is not how uh, common sense uh, operates, but it's also not how international law operates. Um, the rule of proportionality, as I was describing, uh, requires uh, a balance between the military uh, advantage sought to be gained and the anticipated collateral damage. And that is conducted uh, on the basis of the information that is known to a military commander in real time. It's an intention-based uh, rule and analysis. It's not based on, on the effects. And mistakes are sometimes made, especially in the, in the dangerous circumstances and the fog of war. But uh, the real critical thing to assess is how an army uh, operates, how it goes about selecting strikes and applying the laws of armed conflict. And in Israel's case, the Military Advocate General Corps, uh, which is the legal department of the IDF, sits outside of the chain of command. It is answerable to the Attorney General so that those officers in the MAG Corps are able to tell more senior officers in the IDF chain of command yes or no with respect to uh, the striking decisions and what law says. And that's critical. It tells us that Israel puts adherence to international law extremely highly. But I would also uh, warrant that uh, in Israel's case, it goes above the requirements of the laws of armed conflict, especially with respect to the principle of precaution, which is another aspect of the laws of armed conflict that requires law-abiding armies to take uh, precautions to minimize civilian casualties. Israel, in fact, goes over and above uh, both requirements of international law and standard practice of modern uh, law-abiding armies in the warnings that it issues to civilians, in uh, the text messages that it sends to individual householders, the phone calls that it makes, uh, the efforts that the IDF have uh, undertaken in this exchange in Gaza as in previous rounds of conflict in the Gaza Strip are unparalleled in the history of warfare. Uh, and uh, that is, I think, also testament not just to the legal adherence, but also the morality, the code of ethics that the IDF operates to. So one of the arguments put forward is that there isn't proper proportionality here, um, that too many Palestinian civilians have died, specifically children. I think the number that's floated is 4,000 Palestinian children have died. Um, in the conflict. And the question is, how do you do the calculation? So suppose there's a Hamas terrorist or there's a bunch of Hamas terrorists in an area where there's a whole lot of children, let's say it's in a school. Um, what is the, what is the calculation in, in, in pressing the fire button on, on that missile? You know, at what, at what point, a different way to phrase the question is at what point is it, is it not okay? Um, how many children would you need in the vicinity for it not to be okay? And once you reach that answer, let's say it's 10 children for every one of them a spider or 100 children for every one of them a spider, can't you work your way back and say, well, you know, if it's not okay to kill 100 children, surely it's not okay to kill one child. So one of the arguments put forward is, well, if the masses embedded themselves in a civilian population, which it seems is very much a part of their, their ethic or lack of ethics, um, doesn't, doesn't that put further constraints on Israel to do anything at all, um, that involves civilian casualties? If that were the case, it would give Hamas and other, uh, like-minded terrorist organizations, uh, immunity. So uh, I would say that cannot be the case. Uh, and it certainly isn't the case in international law. When we come to the calculations that you've described, we are hamstrung in this instance because we do not have reliable numbers of casualty figures coming out of the Gaza Strip. What Hamas have been putting out through the Ministry of Health that they control in the Gaza Strip uh, are figures that cannot be trusted and critically they do not make um, a distinction between civilians and combatants. They also do not uh, identify how it is that uh, these purported casualty figures uh, have come about their demise. It's important to remember that Hamas have been shooting, uh, fleeing civilians. The United States have confirmed, uh, amongst others, that this is the case, bombing also civilian convoys in the first few weeks of this conflict. Uh, this began uh, because they are so desperate to hang on to 
uh, their human shields. Uh, because uh, for Hamas, this is a win-win situation. Uh, if it drives up casualty figures, uh, you know, purported casualty figures or real ones, uh, then there is international pressure on Israel uh, to cease its lawful um, objectives of, uh, of, of annihilating Hamas and making sure that the threat against Israeli civilians is taken away. Uh, and if it succeeds in uh, dispelling Israeli attacks, as it has done in many cases where Israel has had to call off proposed strikes because there were too many civilians in the vicinity, then it also succeeds in, um, uh, in its immunity uh, from, uh, from the lawful, otherwise lawful attack on a military uh, installation, a uh, Hamas stronghold or a rocket launch site. Um, the numbers here are... are I, as I say, uh, very difficult to navigate, but it's important to do so in the proper context. Um, even going according to Hamas figures uh, and the Israeli figure of 9,000 combatants, which it has confirmed it has killed, 9,000 terrorists that it has identified through intelligence that it knows that it has taken out, then we are, even according to the Hamas casualty figures that we cannot trust, we're looking at a potential civilian to combatant ratio that Israel has estimated of two to one. Now, that sounds awful that two civilians are killed to every one combatant. And it needs to be seen in its proper context because all war is awful. And according to the United Nations, the global average for urban warfare such as this is a staggering nine to one civilians killed. So nine civilians to one combatant, sorry. Uh, in terms of casualty ratios. According uh, to the Americans, um, their statistics for Iraq and Afghanistan are, are between uh, one to three and one to five, five to one and, and three to one. So three civilians killed for every one combatant and five civilians for every one combatant respectively. So in all of those respects and all of those contexts, despite the Hamas tactics here, despite the unparalleled and unprecedented challenges that Israel is encountering of Hamas embedding themselves in schools and hospitals and clinics and using ambulances to transport weapons and, um, and fighters. And uh, it seems now that the tactic that uh, has been uh, well documented is that Hamas fighters dressed in civilian clothes move from house to house. Every second uh, civilian residential house in Gaza, it would seem, has a weapons cache in it. Uh, Hamas fighters move between houses in civilian clothing, go into a house, fire from it, and then leave and go on to the next weapons cache in the next house, uh, thereby seeking to uh, evade um, uh, uh, attack uh, by pretending to be civilians, as well as embedding themselves, of course, amongst uh, real civilians, women and, and children, uh, the sick and the elderly. Uh, and, of course, we also know uh, amongst Israeli hostages. Um, Israel has said it knows where Yihya Sinwar uh, is, and it uh, has him in its sights, but he has surrounded himself with Israeli hostages, seeking to render himself immune from attack. In the context of these tactics, the civilian to combatant ratio is remarkable that Israel has been able to achieve, but it is testament to the lengths that Israel goes to protect the civilians in the Gaza Strip. Uh, not just from Israeli uh, uh, strikes, but also from attack from Hamas themselves. Now, we're speaking on the 15th of January, and uh, a couple of days ago, the South African government um, put forward its case before the International Court of Justice, and Israel was able to respond the following day. Um, the South African government provided Israel with very scant opportunity to put in a defense. Their papers were filed on the 29th of December, and they wanted a hearing within days, um, which is what they really got. Um, what do you make of the case made by South Africa? The South African government claims that Israel is committing genocide, a particularly uh, egregious thing to say about the only Jewish nation where people really did endure a genocide. Um, and then what do you make of Israel's response to that case? Well, the reason that South Africa has levied this particular canard of genocide against the Jewish state is because it provides a hook for jurisdiction at the International Court of Justice. Um, let me be clear, there is no validity, no merit, neither the facts or the law, 
as South Africa are seeking to advance it in its case against Israel. Uh, and its victory in uh, the application that it made uh, against Israel at the International Court of Justice, as you say, on Thursday last week, uh, was as a, as a public relations exercise. This was a set of submissions made for the international media. And in that respect, uh, they have um, certainly been uh, able to achieve a margin of success because the discussion now is as, uh, as preposterous as, uh, as it would, uh, as, as preposterous as it is, uh, the discussion is about whether or not Israel is committing a genocide. The irony of this should not be lost. Uh, ironic because the term genocide was coined by Raphael Lemkin in the aftermath of the Second World War to give a uh, legal uh, lexicon to the annihilation of substantial part of the Jewish people who were exterminated because of their race. And so the crime of genocide is about intending to destroy a people in whole or in part because of who they are. Now, I've talked about some of the measures that Israel has taken to protect the Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Much of the submission that Israel put forward on Friday of last week also evidenced the unparalleled humanitarian efforts and initiatives that Israel has been conducting in the Gaza Strip. And that, uh, coupled with the precautions that are being taken by the IDF, uh, ultimately put the lie to what the uh, South Africans were seeking to advance in terms of intention. Um, in the context of the 84-page application that South Africa advanced, the intention aspects were covered by a series of misrepresentations of quotes of Israeli officials um, where they were talking about Hamas. And the South African uh, legal team uh, presented these quotations as though uh, the Israelis were seeking to um, eliminate the Palestinian people as opposed to Hamas. Well, the intention uh, is clear from the context of the quotations, but it's also clear from the actions on the ground uh, that Israel has gone above and beyond to protect uh, the Palestinian people, even though Hamas continues to subjugate, uh, abuse and, and uh, seek to uh, uh, offer them up as, um, as, as civilian uh, sacrifices to their war effort. Um, whether or not uh, South Africa will be successful in uh, what it seeks to achieve in, in the immediate term, which are provisional measures. And this is, this is why the case was heard so quickly. Um, when you say that it didn't give Israel a chance to respond, I'm, I'm afraid it's even worse than that. It, it transpired from uh, Israel's submissions on the Friday that the usual course, uh, which is that one state um, interacts, corresponds with another to establish uh, whether there is a dispute, if so, what the nature of that dispute between the two states is before an application is brought to the court of uh, the International Court of Justice. It transpires that that, that wasn't done. And it also uh, was part of Israel's case that South Africa has in fact misled the court as to the correspondence that took place between the states before uh, the application was made. And the reason this is significant uh, is because South Africa has, by all accounts, jumped the gun, has made this application uh, without following through the proper processes, the accepted procedure of engaging with the state of Israel before going to the court, which would mean that the court has no jurisdiction to even hear the matter. Um, so we'll have to see what the International Court of Justice determines, but it is of critical importance, not just to Israel, but to all law-abiding states, upholders of the rule of law, because the International Court of Justice is currently being abused by South Africa. South Africa that seems to be championing the terrorists, Hamas, the internationally prescribed terrorist organization. And Hamas came out to formally thank South Africa for their good work at the International Court of Justice in the wake of their submissions. Um, so the fact that uh, the South Africans seek to promote the cause of Hamas uh, are seeking a, an order or an indication from the court that Israel should immediately cease its operation in Gaza against Hamas, its lawful self-defense, um, means that uh, in very many respects, I think there can be arguments that the South Africans are themselves now complicit in the genocide that Hamas began on the 7th of October and is seeking to continue. And here we're talking about real genocide, acts that are coupled with the intent to eradicate Jews, and Hamas leadership has been clear about that. So in this topsy-turvy uh, world in which we live, in this grotesque inversion of Hamas's application, um, 
the danger of this is is not necessarily strictly for for Israel. I mean, if if the court um, orders Israel to cease its its self defense, that is of course contrary to its inherent rights under international law. And I, I cannot see a situation in which Israel would be able to sit on its hands while its civilians are continuing uh, to be subject to bombardment by Hamas. And while uh, Hamas are, are continuing to, to seek to replicate the 7th of October and while they hold over 100 hostages that they are, are, are doubtless continuing um, to abuse. So in those circumstances, I cannot uh, see what practical impact uh, provisional measures ordered by the court would have other than to utterly undermine the credibility of the court. And I think this much has been recognized by the United States by the United Kingdom, by Germany, who have all come out to condemn what they consider to be a meritless case. And Germany in particular has said that it will be making submissions on Israel's behalf if this matter moves past the preliminary stage to the substantive hearings. Uh, the reason we need to watch this space, as I think lawyers, uh, is, is not just because of uh, potential ramifications for, for Israel in international legal discourse, but critically also for where the International Court of Justice is heading. Because if it has now also become a casualty of lawfare, which is an abuse of legal processes and an abuse of legal institutions to promote a political agenda, then that is a very sad day for international law and order. Let's return to the humanitarian question. Um, I think your point is very well put that Israel has aided in humanitarian um, efforts. One of the objections put forward uh, by the pro-Palestinian side is that Israel has generated a humanitarian nightmare um, by moving large parts of Gaza to other parts of Gaza, by um, undermining um, reproductive rights because uh, hospital facilities that allow for women to to give birth safely have been undermined. Um, how do you how do you uh, weigh up those sort of claims uh, against against Israel's uh, objective to to eliminate Hamas? Well, I think the first thing is that these claims need to be called out for being false. Uh, in terms of uh, the hospitals allegation, uh, it's clear, and there is mounting evidence of Hamas systematically using hospital and medical facilities as terror command and control centers and as critical parts of its terror infrastructure. This is not just a, a violation of the laws of armed conflict. It is a grotesque violation when one considers that hospitals in particular are the most protected um, buildings in the context of the laws of armed conflict. Even a military hospital is protected uh, if it is being used uh, solely for the purpose of, of treating uh, military wounded. And here uh, uh, Hamas is, is abusing the laws of armed conflict uh, to further these aims. And quite the contrary, Israel has been very careful with respect to uh, dealing with the terror infrastructure embedded in these hospitals. Uh, in Al-Shifa, of course, it, rather than bombarding the hospital, it went in uh, at great danger and threat to, uh, to the um, soldiers themselves. But they went into the hospital with medics and with Arabic speakers in order to try and distinguish the uh, terrorist combatant from uh, the legitimate sick uh, and medical staff. And this, I stress, was after repeated warnings uh, and requests that people evacuate the hospital. Uh, and that leads me on to the, the first point that you uh, raised, which is to do with the movement of, of civilians uh, in Gaza. Let me be clear, Israel cannot, uh, and certainly at the start of this process, when it gave the civilian population three weeks to evacuate the north of Gaza before it began its operations there against Hamas, Israel had no control or power to force civilian movements anywhere. It sought to create safe corridors and safe areas, uh, humanitarian zones, which in fact Hamas specifically fired at Israel from again, uh, abusing uh, the, 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 the very essence of, of the laws of armed conflict and the principle of distinction, of separating between civilians and combatants. Uh, Hamas does not do that. Um, but quite apart from Israel having any ability to, uh, to force civilians to move anywhere, what it did was, was seek to uh, provide safe routes for evacuation and encourage civilians to leave the central 
uh, terrorist infrastructure in the north of uh, the Gaza Strip in order to save their lives. And for that to be so utterly inverted and used against Israel in this fashion uh, is Kafkaesque. Uh, it is, um, I think, also probably unparalleled in, in the history of international law that one has such a, a grotesque uh, inversion of reality and, and the truth uh, and uh, it being used to ground allegations of, of that nature. So that's the first thing that we need to do is call out the falsehoods here. And when it comes to balancing, well, you know, that's all to do with the proportionality exercise uh, that Israel is required to uh, conduct, uh, and it does so. And, and we see the results of that. Um, many of, of the casualties uh, that the IDF have suffered uh, as a result of going house to house uh, are because Israel is trying to conduct this conflict in a surgical fashion and ensure that it targets the Hamas terrorists in amongst the civilian uh, population that has uh, refused to comply, uh, that has refused to uh, evacuate. Um, and uh, we're seeing on a daily basis uh, the results of that unfortunate, um, the unfortunate consequences of that, but it is a decision that Israel takes because uh, it holds so highly the preservation uh, of all civilian life. So one move that's often made in these discussions is to claim that Israel has been uh, unfairly targeted, that the number of resolutions at the United Nations that target Israel, I think, far exceeds those against all other countries in the world, uh, that many of those that sit on human rights councils, those states are involved in horrendous human rights atrocities, that uh, in South Africa, you find that there's very little condemnation of the treatment of Muslims around the world, that no one talks about the Uyghurs, no one talks about people being killed in Sudan. And in fact, the South African government provided a safe passage to um, someone who was charged with genocide, Omar al-Bashir, um, that yep. he was um, um, allowed to escape um, from South Africa despite South Africa signing the Rome Statute, which would have obliged it to hand Omar al-Bashir off to the ICC. So there's that claim. And the other claim is that whenever any of these examples are brought up, the claim is that it's a whataboutism, that you're changing the topic in an unfair manner. So how do we distinguish between those two things, where the one is to provide a context and the other is to unfairly change the topic? Um, it, the issue here is that it's not simply what about. Um, it's not that you know Israel is a uh, violator of international law, but so are loads of others and everyone's focusing on Israel. It's that... Um, Actors like the South Africans, but they're certainly not alone. And the references that you made to UN resolutions are a case in point. Um, they attribute to Israel uh, breaches of international law, which are simply not true, while at the same time ignoring the real violations of international law and the real abuses uh, of human rights. The disproportionate focus on Israel um, would be terrible uh, if Israel was just as much of a human rights violator as all of the others that were lacking in, in a lens being placed upon them. Uh, but the reason that it is uh, so much worse than that is because of the fabrications around Israel uh, and the, um, the human rights situation. Um, this, I think, uh, ultimately can only be explained by uh, what has been referred to as, a, as an evolution of anti-Semitism. Um, a mutating virus that anti-Semitism is. It, it takes on different forms in throughout the ages. In fact, uh, the late uh, great Rabbi uh, Lord Jonathan Sachs, um, uh, the former Chief Rabbi of, of, of the United Kingdom, uh, talked about this mutating virus that began in, in the Middle Ages uh, with a focus on Jews as a religion, and one had the ancient blood libels of Jews killing Christian children to use their blood to make matzah or for religious rituals. He explained that when uh, science took over from religion as the order of the day, the hatred of the Jews mutated into a hatred of the Jewish race. And so the pseudoscience of eugenics was used by the Nazis to justify their hatred of the Jewish race. And Lord Sachs explained that in uh, the modern era, international law and human rights even had taken over uh, from science as the order of the day. And so the hatred of the Jews manifested itself as a hatred of the Jewish state. And the modern blood libels are those that we see being aired against Israel at institutions like the United Nations. 
ethnic cleansing, colonialism, occupation, oppression, apartheid, illegality, human rights violations, war crimes. These are the modern blood libels. And so it's important not just to point out where the real violations are happening, which I appreciate is what you refer to as whataboutery, but to call out the untruths against the only Jewish state. Because the blood libel in the Middle Ages was widely believed. And these modern blood libels have gained traction because of this process of lawfare, which has been decades in the making, and because of armies of NGOs that manufacture these allegations and, and pseudo-evidence that they uh, seek to put before uh, international legal organizations, and uh, the application that was advanced by South Africa cited. Chapter and verse, much of uh, that false material, seeking uh, through its application, in fact, and through the consideration of the court of these reports to, to receive the, the judicial stamp of approval on these falsehoods. That is an integral part of the lawfare process that South Africa have adopted and another important parallel track and aim uh, that is uh, being sought to be achieved uh, through, the, through the case at the International Court of Justice. And it's important that we, we call that out, not just say there is disproportionate focus on Israel, but also there is utterly wrongful focus on Israel uh, on the basis of false allegations. You mentioned occupation. And that seems to be one of the the, uh, the feet in this argument um, that's been used since the beginning. Um, what what is the argument um, that's being put forward for Israel's occupation of Gaza that it is an occupation and has been for decades, and and why is it a poor argument? Well, the argument that's advanced, and I don't think it's taken seriously by any um, international lawyers well, worth their salt is that um, because uh, there is a, an argument that Israel control, again, it's, it's based on false premises. So it runs like this. Israel controls uh, the Gaza Strip because it controls the uh, borders, it controls the airspace, it controls uh, shipping and what goes in. Um, now, that is factually incorrect, of course, because if anyone looked at a map, they would see that Gaza also borders Egypt as well as Israel. Uh, but the reason that it's also, uh, even if that were the case, it would be legally incorrect is because that is not how the occupation uh, framework operates. Uh, and that is why the, the term occupation here is being used as a, as a political term. It is without legal basis. It is an abuse of international law. Um, under the Hague regulations, occupation requires effective control. Well, you can see that Israel has not had any control over the Gaza Strip because over the last 16 years, Hamas has turned it into a terror base. And since Israel withdrew in 2005, and then subsequently there were elections in 2006 and Hamas uh, launched a, a violent takeover or a coup in 2007, uh, it, Israel has not had any control of what goes on in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and in excess of its international legal obligations, it has, however, continued to supply um, the Palestinians in Gaza uh, with, uh, with supplies with humanitarian supplies, with a portion of, of its water and a portion of its electricity, by no means all of it. There is a great deal of factual misrepresentation that is, uh, that is at issue here. But when we look at the concept of occupation, I think we need to look at you know, where, where it has come from and what international law says about the legal status of the territory. And here we're faced with, a, with another massive misrepresentation and, and misapplication of international law. There is a universal rule uh, that tells us the borders of a state when it comes into existence. It is a matter of customary international law. It is called uti possidetis juris, and it seems to be applied absolutely everywhere except with respect to the Jewish state. So this is a rule that developed uh, in the 18th, 19th century. It was applied in South America, the withdrawal of the Spanish. It was applied in Asia, in Africa, uh, the dissolution of the former communist federations. And it was applied to all the states that emerged from mandates. Um, the International Court of Justice recognized the development of this rule, or T. Posidetis Juris, in the, Burkina, uh, in the Burkina Faso Mali case in the 1980s. And it talked about why this rule had come into existence. Um, this rule dictated that, uh, dictates still, that a new state, when it comes into existence, inherit the pre existing administrative lines that preceded it. Um, so whatever entity was there before, if a state comes in, it declares itself uh, within that territory, then the lines, absent any agreement to the contrary, so this is a default rule, those administrative lines become the new state's international borders. 
And when the court analyzed the emergence of this rule, it talked about the reasons that it had developed to provide stability and certainty and to prevent fratricidal struggles uh, and to provide clean lines. Well, in Israel's case, after uh, the severance by the British of the uh, Transjordan part of the mandate, which later became the Hashemite Kingdom, uh, the eastern boundary of the British mandate in 1948 ran along the Jordan River and all the way south to the Red, to, to the Red Sea. Uh, so when Israel declares independence in 1948, it's the only state, the only state to come into existence. The Declaration of Independence doesn't make any mention of borders or boundaries. It simply refers to Eretz Israel, the land of Israel. But Uti Posidetis Juris works as a default rule. It works in the absence of any agreement to the contrary. And according to the application of this universal rule of customary international law, Israel inherited the pre-existing administrative lines of the mandate as, as its international borders. Now, in the context of uh, the eastern boundary, that included uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem. In the context of, of the western boundary with Egypt, that included Gaza. That was part of the British Mandate territory. Now, in 1948, Israel is attacked immediately at its declaration of independence. And Jordan occupies uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and Egypt occupies Gaza. What happens in 1967? Israel recovers that territory in, in Jordan, uh, from Jordan, uh, the East, uh, East Jerusalem and West Bank that had been ethnically cleansed by the Jordanians of their Jews. Israel recovers that territory. So what is the status of that territory? If it was originally Israeli sovereign territory and then under Jordanian occupation, what happens when Israel takes it back? We have a parallel example, a modern one, in the context of Rus Russia and Ukraine. So Ukraine's borders were formed according to the rule of Utiposidetis Juris, and that is why it is uh, generally accepted that Crimea is part of Ukraine and Russia has occupied Crimea from Ukraine, in the same way that Jordan occupied the West Bank and East Jerusalem from Israel. And if Ukraine were to recover Crimea in the context of this war that Russia has waged against it, would anyone accuse Ukraine of occupying Crimea from Russia? Of course not. And yet we have an inversion of international law when it comes to Israel. Now, it's critical to be clear that we're talking about the underlying status of the territory. This doesn't presuppose what any political settlement ought to look like. Uh, and plainly, when Israel recovered that territory in the West Bank, in 1967, it, it instituted a temporary administration. It did not apply its law administration and sovereignty in full in the same way that it did in Jerusalem, because it anticipated under the land for peace formula that it would uh, inevitably provide a portion of that land to Jordan as part of the peace agreement. When that peace agreement finally came around in 1994, uh, the Jordanians didn't want any part of it. So that ship sailed, and subsequently Israel has uh, consistently sought to negotiate under that land for peace formula uh, with the Palestinians and Oslo was an, uh, uh, the Oslo process was a critical part of that. But that's all the politics of this. If we're talking about the law and being honest about the application of international law to the status of the territory, then this term occupation has no place here. It is a political term. It has no legal uh, basis. If it's the case that Israel is able to eradicate Hamas, what obligations does it have to the Palestinians who reside there? What obligations does it have to its own citizens? So what should be done going forward? That's a big question. Um, when I talked about uh, the absence of occupation as a, as a legitimate framework in international law, um, of course, that is the case as of uh, the 6th of October, the 7th of October, and certainly through the, the early period uh, of Israel's war in Gaza. Um, the situation on the ground is changing all of the time. And if and when it gets to a point where Israel does, in fact, have effective control over some of the territory, uh, then the legal framework in that position will change. Um, so that's something to be mindful of. But in the context of you know, what happens essentially the day after this war, the day after Israel is able to successfully eradicate Hamas, um, that is a big question. And I think the best uh, proposals that I have seen uh, that have been mooted so far rely on uh, going back to basics in terms of the uh, culture and the society and the societal building blocks in the Gaza Strip and ensuring that uh, rather than a 
a terrorist organization, an extremist um, prescribed group like Hamas, uh, which is essentially a proxy for the Iranian regime, rather than importing uh, the Palestinian Authority who support terrorism uh, through their pay for slave program and their indoctrination program. Um, there ought to be self-governance in the Gaza Strip and security uh, and a, a provision to make sure that nothing like Hamas's takeover of the Gaza Strip can ever happen again. There are proposals for, uh, if you will, a formulation along the lines of the Marshall Plan uh, to rebuild uh, Germany uh, after the Second World War that are being mooted also. Uh, but they have to be seen in parallel and alongside a denazification process, a process that grapples with uh, the rotten education system, the UN-run UNRWA schools that are promoting terrorism and indoctrinating child abuse, indoctrinating kindergarten children uh, to want to grow up to become terrorists. That has to be grappled with because there will never be a solution in which uh, the Gaza Strip uh, ceases to pose a threat to Israel while that indoctrination continues. And the international community have to take responsibility for it because it is with international funding of these textbooks and these schools and these UN-run programs that they have been fueling the conflict. And that is something that the world needs to stand up and take responsibility for and make sure that going forward, uh, the same mistakes are not repeated. Well, Natasha, I want to thank you for an absolutely incredible conversation. Um, you've provided so much light at a time of darkness, and I just applaud the work that you continue to do um, to ensure that everybody finds out what is really happening in Israel, um, happening with the law, and uh, I just wish you um, all of the best. Thank you so much. It's very good to be with you, and I very much hope for better times for all of us.